now. Okay. Uh, welcome to Dog Central on a Thursday afternoon. I am Graham Coffey. I am joined by my good friend and co-host, Mr. Josh Hancher. Uh, it is September, but it is also somehow uh, Georgia-Auburn week, Deep South's oldest rivalry. Can't really square that in my head properly, but here we are. Josh, how are you doing? How are you feeling? What do you think about all this? Well, it's starting to feel a little bit like fall. You have to you just really squint your eyes and feel like it's Auburn week. But any week is a good week to hate Auburn. Um, I'm full on Auburn hate week. It's some. Of, it's actually my favorite group of Twitter people. Some good people and good dudes out there. But it's you know we're all being obnoxious this week, so I, I like it. I can't wait for the game. Three thirty kick. Rumors of all orange, so that'll be hideous. <laughs> I saw that today, and then I saw like. Not too long later, Georgia put out a tweet, and it was like, going with the classic whites this weekend, uh, which I thought was kind of funny. Just yeah, like, you know. I, saw that, I saw that too, but I don't know if they have, have a choice, really. But <laughs> I, so. I don't think they do, but I, I did see somebody make the uh, point of, like, an orange out is maybe what you do when you think that there's going to be a whole lot of red in your stadium. And you want to make sure it just kind of blends in. Yeah, that's an interesting conspiracy, at least. Yeah, I mean, I guess technically we they they it's only an orange out. They haven't committed to the orange jerseys yet. It could be just a wear your orange kind of thing. So, but yeah, it's fun. It's good stuff for it's good stuff for rivalry week. It is. Yeah, it definitely is. And you know. Uh, I, I like this game. I think it's a fun game. Uh, I think it's one that, you know, the word rivalry gets thrown around a little bit too much, uh, especially in this day and age when, like, you know, people are trying to hype content and get get ratings and all of that stuff. Like, this is a real rivalry game with real hate that spans multi-generational, like, you know, lots and lots of different instances in this rivalry from both sides where, you know, it's not just a regular game. And I also think this is one of those, you know, like my uncle went to Auburn. Um, he grew up in a tiny town called Andalusia, Alabama, like, you know, drinking the Auburn Kool-Aid from the time he was a little boy. Uh, he did end up getting his career from Georgia because he got his law school. He went to law school at UGA and he's a lawyer. So everyone's always giving him shit about that. But uh yeah, I don't know. In that in that sense, it's always felt like kind of a family rivalry to me, where like there's usually some some people oh, yeah. on both sides at Thanksgiving. Yeah, my brother went to Auburn when Bo was there. So really, I, a, yeah, I didn't I even know a, you had a brother. Yeah, I got two. I got one went to Auburn, one went to Tech. So uh, I actually, and then the my brother went to Tech was there in '90. So oh wow, uh, um, yeah, it was. I kind of grew up cheering for Auburn. I lived in Dothan. As uh, as you yeah. may have seen, going after Barning Hard on Twitter about Dothan's always fun. So yeah, it definitely is family. <laughs> some of my best friends are Auburn alums, and 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 some of them actually Auburn fans, and some of them actually went there. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's we're gonna clip that and share it on Twitter. Um. <laughs> Oh, that was good stuff. All right. Well, uh, that's my, that's my paper right there. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Talk shit to me. I got <laughs> the piece of paper, baby. Um, okay. Uh, you just reminded me to remind everybody that we are sponsored by homefieldapparel.com. Um, they make the best softest and most funly designed uh throwback apparel whether you're a georgia fan or an auburn fan they've got great stuff uh i'm wearing one of their shirts today i got a bunch of cozy sweatshirts from them that my wife continues to steal they do a really good job their stuff is really comfortable uh you know help us support the people that support us um you can use code dog central 23 that's D A W G S Central 2 3 for 20% off on their website, which is homefieldapparel.com. And uh, yeah, get geared up. 
uh, it's moving towards fall eventually here in the south, and uh, you'll you'll want some sweatshirts and some some cozy threads to to look nice as you uh, go about your day. So get it from home field and uh, support support us. Um, all right, Josh. Well, so we got a lot of good stuff here uh, from a film standpoint and from your preview standpoint. Uh, do you want to jump into the tape first and then we can go into the PDF and, and kind yeah, of, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That'll, that'll lend into the sort of predictions and stuff. So uh, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. As you can see folks, we just, you know, we just feel it out on the fly here on the dog central YouTube channel. Um, cool. Okay. Well, yeah. So I've uh, pulled some clips and Josh, uh, was awesome enough to cut up some games. Uh, he cut up the Auburn and Cal game as well as the Auburn A and M game. Let me make this big for the people at home here. Um, uh oh, there we go. All right. So um, let's go to uh, clip five and clip six if we can. There we go. All right, yeah, so Auburn opened up the game against A&M, kind of daring Wegman to throw downfield, played like a lot of soft zone, uh, gave him room to throw underneath against safeties who were kind of sitting past the sticks. They hit hard. Uh, like Auburn secondary, they thump. That's one thing that really uh, kind of stood out to me uh, here. So, yeah, like – they're physical in the back end. They've got a lot of guys who they play, and they've got a quite a few who are questionable. So that's going to be kind of a mystery, I think, of who exactly they play. Um, their run defense, they're, they're good at times, but they've struggled as well with giving up the big play. And I think a lot of that has to do with poor tackling. You kind of saw that there. Um, that's the defensive end. On the left side, 35, McLeod. He's a good player, but he's he's also kind of prone to throwing his shoulder in instead of wrapping up. Their defensive backs, like we were just talking about, really aggressive. They fly downhill. Uh, 36 is Jalen Simpson, and he is a very good player. Uh, Fifth-year guy, never given up more than 55% reception percentage in a season. Can tackle, cover. Uh, number four is DJ James. You're going to see some more of him as we go. He missed three tackles against A&M and got hit for a 26-yard reception. Like, he's a guy that you might want to scheme for if you're Georgia. Uh, and here he comes right here with a missed tackle in space. That's what we call transition in the business. And A&M really struggled to run inside the tackles against Auburn, but um, they uh, they did, like – you know, managed to, uh, Cal did Cal managed to run inside the tackles on him. Cal got some chunk runs outside the tackle box. Uh, and then, you know, they had some times like they weren't busting 60 yard runs up the middle, but they were able to hit some of these gaps. Like they had eight yards in attempt off left guard, 7.4 yards in attempt between center and right guard and four yards in attempt between, center and left guard like that's efficient offense if georgia could do that on saturday then they will have a very good day i'm not i'm not i'm honestly not sure if they can truthfully like uh but cal did so you know um number 99 jason jones and number 50 marcus harris are a pretty solid tackle duo i think those guys are good they more than controlled the a gaps against against a&m um a&m really couldn't run inside but they they were able to do this like they were able to break some big runs kind of, you know, uh, off inline tight ends or outside the tackle box. Um, and yeah, like these body blows that AM delivered with the run game kind of added up in the fourth quarter and the left side of their, of Auburn's defensive line finally sort of broke down. Um, I expect like Auburn's first 11 on defense is pretty good. Uh, they just don't have the rotational depth and I expect Georgia will try to kind of wear them down and uh, get to the fourth quarter and get those guys sucking it, sucking air and, and lean on them similar to how they played against South Carolina. All right. So 
on the pass rush front, they're not a great pass rushing team. That DL struggles to create pressures. Um, so they use their back seven on delayed blitzes a lot, and that's really true on third and long. Number 12 is Caleb Wooden, so strong safety. He's going to get the sack here. Interesting player. He had three pressures against AM and only rushed three times. So that's 100% on pass rush to pressure ratio. Uh, they need him situationally to do stuff like that, but he is also a poor tackler and not very good in coverage. So if you see him on the field, like he did still play some, some coverage snaps, right? Uh, he, he's only played 34 coverage snaps this year, but has allowed four catches for 47 yards. And all of those yards have come after the catch. So he's not a good tackler. Uh, so interesting guy to watch on Saturday. Can Georgia kind of like hit him at the right time, catch him in coverage and create a big play off of it or, Will Auburn, you know, be a little more uh, conservative in terms of putting him in in blitz only situations? A um, and M did not. Uh, oh wait, yeah, A and M. No, 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 you're good. Uh, okay. So this is uh, this is Donovan Kaufman, and he's another one of these guys who like thumps and is really important to their run defense. Uh, he comes up and in the from the back seven. He's a slot corner slash safety type player, but uh, he also is the one that loses the tight end there um, on, on the touchdown. So it's kind of a, a hit or miss for him. That's him as well. Number five missing the tackle. Uh, they th this is kind of what we're talking about with the uh, if you'll pause for a quick second with the, the secondary injuries. So. Kaufman is questionable for Saturday with an ankle injury, and he was already playing out of position at slot corner because uh, another Tiger is injured. And then Zion Puckett is number 10 at safety. He's a very – he might be kind of their, their best back seven defender. He's questionable with a sol sh shoulder injury. Uh, and then, he, you know, he was also their highest graded coverage player against A&M, so – before that, they were without Keontae Scott, who started at slot corner for the first two games. Uh, point being, like, they're getting thin on some of these players in the back seven. And the tough part about that for Georgia is, like, you don't have a ton of tape on some of these guys. But uh, you would assume they're not as good as the guys they're replacing. And some of the guys they were replacing – you know, did have kind of flaws in their games. So it's going to be interesting to see if Georgia is able to do a little more against that secondary than people maybe think they can. Um, all right. Sorry for the long spiel. Okay. Uh, you got, we're on schedule here at clip 20. So all those injuries are going to put an added emphasis on number 36, who is Jalen Simpson. He's one of the best defensive players on this defense through four games, solid tackler in space. That catch right there is the, the longest gain he's given up in coverage all year. Um, George is going to want to try and occupy him and run routes to pull him out of the play. And that's him, you know, there. Uh, that, that's going to be uh, Kalen Lee, number three. He split time last week with Nehemiah Pritchett, who was playing in his first game of the season. Um, Lee gave up a 37-yard touchdown catch to Evan Stewart. But he also, like, he, it wasn't really a bad play. Like, Evan Stewart just kind of made a, a very good play. Like, Lee is a good player. And I bring up Pritchett because that's the guy that Ladd McConkey burned twice against Auburn when they came to the Plains in 2021. Um, he's a better player now than he was then. He was an inexperienced young boundary corner at the time. But be curious to see if those two go up against each other. Uh, Pritchett, if you're keeping score at home, is number one. And then the last uh, clip we have for the defense, number nine, Eugene Asante, linebacker. Uh, he's going to pick up this fumble here and run to the house. This is a nice play for him. In truth, he's a guy I think Georgia can pick up uh, – I'm sorry, pick on in zone coverage. Gave up three catches on four targets for 31 yards and just 18 coverage snaps against A&M. So uh, he can – he can be fooled, particularly I noticed Max Johnson kind of like using his eyes to pull him out of plays and then uh, getting easy yards off of that. Okay, catch our breath. We're moving on to Auburn's offense now. Uh, 
Josh, you did a really good job of breaking down some Auburn quarterback info on Twitter yesterday. Uh, they got three quarterbacks, which really means they have no quarterbacks. And they have not passed for 100-plus yards against a P5 opponent since facing Arkansas October 29th of last year. Uh, Peyton Thorne has this instinct to tuck it and run like we saw in that first play. Um, and if his first read is covered, then he's just going to, like, take his eyes down. Um, you're going to see here – you already saw him overthrow one receiver. Now he's going to overthrow – a wide open receiver. <laughs> yeah, you gotta hit the, you gotta know that wheel routes there. I mean, it's like you know that was terrible. That's a free touchdown. Like, and and yeah. Auburn is a team that like they kind of maybe need a coverage bust to throw an explosive passing touchdown. Uh, again, overthrows are a theme. That's an interception he threw right before the half against Cal, and he's got this hurried clock, like because his OL, especially the right side of his offensive line, has struggled mightily um like he got sacked three times on just 19 dropbacks against cal uh so Auburn yeah, does like, have a running game i'm sorry go yeah ahead. yeah i was just gonna say you know it seemed to me watching it there i noted that the longest pass versus you know cal and a&m their two power five teams was 17 yards it seems like they've got to get him designed out of the pocket for him to find a guy in the uh, you know, a running back or someone underneath, it just seems like they're going to have to move the pocket because when he just stands there, it just looks like he's a statue. Um, and it seems like that could be a problem for a team that's going to need to put up some points on on Saturday. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. Um, I, I, you know, with with Ashford, when he comes in, and he's the guy that played quarterback against Georgia last year, it does seem to help their running game some. Uh it kind of creates more lanes because the defense has to account for his legs on the backside. You see there, like they, they get a little more room on some of these kind of shotgun sweep zone read concepts. Although he is somehow even worse at throwing the ball than Thorne. That is, I mean, that's, that's like, that's dude. Like, I don't know what to say about that. I know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Par Charles Barkley said it best. If we're baptizing and praying for people at Auburn, let's get a let's pray for better quarterback plays. <laughs> uh scoot back if you don't mind real quick to that play again. So that's Jay Fair, who has been a bright spot. He plays 90 plus percent of his snaps in the slot. So look for him there. Uh he's got good run after the catch ability. Uh 93 of his 184 yards receiving have come after the catch. Georgia's got to tackle that guy in space. Him and Tyke Smith will be a good matchup. Um that is Shane Hooks. He's kind of the only other true receiver that you got to worry about. Uh works the boundary. 92.5% of his snaps are as a boundary guy. Uh poor reception percentage though. Targeted 17 times, only has 8 catches for 106 yards so far. Uh, yeah, he that's, led. That's he had, he's one of these plays where he's got to get on the move. You know, like he just immediately gets on the move, finds his guy. That's that's where I saw him. You know, with any kind of decent quarterback play. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, it you. seems like they need to roll the pocket for for Thorne a little bit or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, the problem with hooks is like they targeted him five times last week, and that only netted them eighteen yards. That's not really efficient offense. Um, but that catch that you just saw there, that 13 yard catch was Auburn's longest pass play of the game last week. Yeah. He's got a 1.4 yards uh, per yard per root run or whatever you like to. And he's, he's got 17 targets. So he's getting a lot of roots and it's not developing into consistent, you know, successful uh, offensive plays there, but he, he, you know, but boomer bus guy. Totally. Um, same might be kind of true of this guy, which is tight end Rivaldo Fairweather. He's probably the scariest target on their team. FIU transferred. That 28-yard catch is the uh, – that kind of saved the game for Auburn. Um, and then he's going to uh, make a show play. It, show it again here, and then we'll move on to the next one there because it was a sweet play. <laughs> it was yeah. I think that's their longest pass play of the year against a P5 opponent. Um, A&M focused on him heavily five yards on four targets, three catches. And that's why like that was the play that won the game for them against Cal. He is the jump guy or the jump ball guy on this offense. Um, six, four, you know, big enough to body guys out. 
Uh, Auburn still has Jarquez Hunter, and he's a good player, 146 yards so far this year, averaging 4.6 yards a carry. Big back who does not go down easily. You need to wrap him up, and you want to keep him from hitting the second level with a full head of steam. Uh, these runs were some of Auburn's biggest plays of the day against AM. They were able to kind of hit up in these A gaps a couple times. And he averaged nearly four yards after contact per a carry against AM, which is which is really high. Like he's he's a bruiser back. Um, and then behind him was Damari Alston, who had been playing really well. He got hurt against AM. They bring in Brian Beatty, Batty. Uh, 21, and he played well. 11 carries for 59 yards, and he was actually Auburn's leading receiver in this game with two catches for 23 yards. So uh, watch him. He's kind of going to be the scat back style, Mac Kenny McIntosh style back to go with the more physical Hunter. Um, as you, I mean, that's a that's a good move in space right there. You know, he put the dream shake on him. So interested to see if they can get him involved in the pass game. Uh, Tigers are pretty balanced between gap and zone so far this year, but they haven't been great in short yard situations like you just saw there on clip 95. Um, they're like you would expect an Auburn offensive line to blow Cal off the football on third and three, and this is like a stretch zone concept that just goes totally awry. Um, I think. You know, uh, I think right guard number 62, Cameron Stutz, is the best run blocker. Uh, but he's also maybe the worst pass blocker. So that's a problem for them. Uh, and then you see there on 130, the left side of Auburn's offensive line, pretty good in pass protection. The right side, uh, Isaiah Miller, 72, is the right tackle. Uh, Lows that sack against Cal. Gave up four pressures against A&M. Georgia's going to hunt him. And then they're also going to hunt the aforementioned Stutz. He gave up two pressures and two sacks against Cal, in addition to five pressures and two sacks against a and uh, Hard to not think about Warren Brinson when you look at him after the, the games that Brinson's had lately. Uh, so that's, that's the matchup for Georgia, I think, is trying to take advantage of the right side of that offensive line. The left side uh, – it's been pretty good. Number 52, Dylan Wade. Number 53, Gunner Britton. Uh, they've only given up one pressure slash one sack com in a combined 68 pass blocking snaps in the game against A&M. So um, those guys kind of held their own against a pretty talented A&M defensive line. But uh, the same cannot be said for uh, – what's his face? Um <laughs> the right side, Isaiah Miller and Stutz. Sorry, <laughs> that's a lot of names, dude. You killed it again. That's uh, thanks, 30, man. 40 plays gave you a feel for everything you're going to see. Gave us the names, gave us the strengths, gave us weaknesses. Bravo. In addition to uh, the stats and schemes that you've put up on the site, so um, well, speaking of stats and player data and all that, let's uh, you've been, dude, like these. PDFs that you've been creating uh, for for Dog Central and and for uh, just you know Twitter and stuff like have been incredible. You've really elevated yeah, being, your, your graphics. Yeah, being able to yeah being able to pull in the player level stuff is very uh, feels good because I've always tried to do that. And it's just you know without you know trying to do this on a weekly schedule. So I was able to do it. It's down and dirty it's screenshots from Excel, but it, I think it gives you it gives us a good idea of of you know. You're looking at, the, you know, the offensive pass success rate or, or lack of success rate in the case of Auburn, and you can go see what's going on at the player level. You can look at the O-line. You can look at, you know, the, the receivers and the quarterback play and, and stuff. So, I yes, thank you for uh, – to allow me to put it up on the site because it, it seems like it's been well-received, and it, I enjoy it a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I, you know, on Twitter yesterday I talked about just how sort of inept the pass offense – has been for for Auburn, and I don't think anybody inside um, Auburn or outside of Auburn would refute that. Um, it's just it's just really really tough. Um, I mean, they knew they were going to have a quarterback problem coming in. Peyton Thorne was uh, just he is just another guy, and maybe not even that good. Right. Um, I would not w tell me if I'm crazy, but wouldn't you see some? You know, I think it's going to be. A rotation maybe heavy on Ashford. I wouldn't be surprised to see some Wildcat or just something. Just they to, gotta to do something, you know. Uh, 
I've contemplated that if they had a bye week before this game, I think they would be able to change a lot more up. But I mean, like running the the shotgun triple option that Coastal runs might be a better friggin' deal at this point than what they're doing on offense. Like they might just need to give up on the pass entirely unless it's with the element of surprise involved, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of like even watching these two games, I, di- I didn't watch the, the UMass to the Mercer game, but the Cal game, I actually watched live and I had the A&M game on too, actually. Um, I had the, the A&M g- g- game on. I was just seeing, you know, it seemed like it was like just a struggle bus the entire game. And then, you know, Load just up. they just know they had nothing on offense. They just so uh, it was – the game was <laughs> – their defense kept them in it for as long as they could. And like you said, you know, you talk about wearing them down in the fourth quarter. Um, yeah, if, if this game is, you know, decided in the third quarter, um, you know, or it, certainly if it's decided in the fourth quarter, um, you – without any offense, you know, you kind of like Georgia to, to uh, God forbid, if it's a game in the fourth quarter, but you're right. <laughs> well, I mean, one thing that's, you know, interesting looking at the data that you have there, uh, like the first thing that sticks out to me actually is uh, the yards per route run on Georgia's receiving. Like we've talked a lot over the years about 2.0, yards per route run kind of be in the benchmark for like elite receiver play. And some of these guys are, you know, they're not getting a ton of routes run or a ton of targets, but like Rose me at 2.98 is a big deal. Bowers at 2.44 rah, rah at 2.38. And then you got muse at 4.08, which is a little more due to, you know, lack of lack of actual pass snaps, but like CJ Smith, 2.59 um point being it, it seems like georgia's got more explosive receiving weapons uh kind of at this point in the season than we've seen them have in a few years um yeah i mean it's been noted how many guys are getting touches you know every mm-hmm. week you know 10 you know 8 9 10 guys are are getting the ball um you know feeding feeding them i don't know if it's just by design or just getting the guys all reps but you know you know, I do expect him to settle in to some more of a state, you know, see less fewer guys, but the same amount of targets, you know, or in terms of pass attempts, excuse me, same amount of pass attempts. So it'd be interesting to see if Love it gets fed as much as he has been, even with the, you know, the split uh, attempts and stuff like that. So he seems to be the guy that's in there. He's, he's got 23 targets only behind only Brock Bowers. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, you'd like to see him erupt. Jack St. Uh, Rosemary Jack Saints just been just seemed like big play after big play. Yards per catch is over 16. Uh, same with Arian Smith. So that's pretty exciting. And then, you know, Ra Ra has only got nine targets, but 20 yards per catch uh, on those 20 targets. So, yeah, he's been explosive. He's the seems like the deep shot guy right now. Yeah. Yeah. As you expect. Well, yeah, him, so, and, him and Arian, you know, it's like it'll be interesting to see if we try those deep shots on, you know, you know, for Beck's first uh, road SEC start, you know, like when those come, when, you know, or do they, they just try to let him air it out early to get, you know, sort of shake, you know, you know, you know sort of loosen him up. But it will be, con- it will be, con- I'm interested in what the game plan is early in that game. Georgia often plays pretty conservative at Auburn, you know, and yards historically are tough to come by there. It's a mm-hmm. tough place to play. So, um, and the running game has been, you know, probably the thing that gives Georgia fans the most anxiety. Um, you know, it's a pretty low EPA. You're looking at it right there. It's a good success rate, but it's a very low explosive rate, play rate and stuff. So, um, you know, it, you know, I, it, Bud, J, uh, J. Bud Davis is, uh, I hope you guys are following him on Twitter. He does amazing stuff. He'll break, he breaks down, um, he gets SIS information and sports info solutions, which gives personnel and all, just a really, really fantastic. And he just talks about how much we're running or, or the stats show how much we're running sort of a zone run scheme. So I don't know, mm-hmm. you've been talking about that for a long time. It'd be curious if, if that just seems like pretty straightforward. If we start to shake it up and start to try to move guys, you know, on the offensive line and make some more holes, because we're going to need to be able to run the ball on this defense. Otherwise, if they just drop back in coverage and we can't run, it could be could be a tight game. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think Bobo is trying to create more gap scheme stuff, but uh, 
right now there's 77 zones and 32 gaps this year, which is far off from the kind of 50, 50 split that they had for the last two seasons. I don't think that's necessarily like by desire. I think it's more, uh, that's what George, like their gap scheme runs. You know, when I did the UAB film review the other night, it's like, you know, here comes a delp a half second too late on a pull or, you know, like they're just not quite hitting the timing right on those. And I expect they will, as the season goes on, um, for whatever reason, Georgia's offensive line and particularly Georgia's guards, like always seem to struggle the first month of the season. And then they kind of build and build as the year goes on. And you could tell last week, like it was definitely the best run blocking performance I've seen from Georgia's offensive line. Same with pass blocking truthfully, like, cause they were picking up like a lot of like six man rushes and stuff and not just picking them up, but like giving Carson Beck four seconds to throw against a six man rush, which like, if that happens, that's, that's why you saw more explosive pass plays. Right. But um, I think that run game is like this close to popping the big one, you know, um, like there was so many plays against UAB where it was like one guy was just halfway off on his block or this thing goes and, you know, credit to like Rose me getting back in the lineup, I think has helped them. Same with Jackson Meeks. Like he was on the field, the first drive against UAB uh, because I think of his run blocking, like those two guys, when they get out there, they're, they're paving the way. It would be nice if you could, Get you know like Meeks catching that ball last week, or you know Beck not overthrowing Meeks on that deep shot that was wide open would have been so big down the road schematically for Georgia because like you've proven that you will throw this guy a deep shot and that he will catch it for a touchdown. And so uh, as a defense, you can't just treat him like a a blocker, you know. But uh, I digress a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, That's good. Yeah, I was gonna say. I was going to just, I was going to say, you know, if you're looking at the, the Auburn defense in this little play by play, I don't know if you've got the defense, Georgia's offense versus the defense there, but you can tell that the, the strength of this Auburn defense is the secondary. Mm-hmm. You got like four guys that are, you know, 76 or better PFF grades, um, and only a couple oh, guys. Right. Ab- That's- yeah. But I got some updated ones that, that might have, you might not have to. Oh, no. Out. I was just on the wrong page. Okay. Yeah. And you've got just a handful of guys in the front in the secondary, um, excuse me, a handful of guys in the front seven that are, are graded that high thus far by PFF. So, you know, you, you want to be able to, to attack those underneath routes with Bowers and some of those guys, you want to be able to run the ball so that those big chunk plays uh, either whether chunk plays run the ball or chunk plays to our, you know, our wide receivers are open and stuff. So it'll be, you know, I don't think we want to get in a situation where we need to, to, you know, let them tee off um, and let them put extra guys in coverage because they're, they're good. And I said in the preseason, I was like, this defense is good. I was like, it could ruin somebody's season. Um, I hope it's not ours. I don't feel like it's going to be ours, but I feel, mm-hmm. I still feel like this team defensively is going to be, make it really hard on, on um, an SEC contender. And, and we're going to find out how good they are on Saturday. I think, you know, cause they're going to be put to the test. Absolutely. Yeah. And you see here, uh, you know, on the screen, we got, we got the zoom in capabilities with the PDF. So uh, that's the secondary you're talking about DJ James. You know, we talked about him in the film a little bit, like good in coverage prone to missing tackles, kind of like a, you know, boomer bust type player. Uh, Puckett, I think is better than that 70.1 grade. Jalen Simpson. We talked about maybe he's might be the best player in this back seven. And then Kaufman, who was the guy, you know, we discussed being so key in run support for them. And you see that with the 13 tackles, um, five pressures, like they, the, but the problem is, I mean, and then rim down there with the 76th grade, all those guys, not all of them, but like three of those guys are questionable for this game. And I think that's a, that's a storyline that I was not honestly aware of until last night when I was doing some of these notes. Um, that's a big deal because like you said, that is the strength of their defense. And I think that Georgia, like their, their past game has been the more consistent force so far this year, especially because of the running back injuries. And if Georgia can come out in the first quarter of this game and attack some of those new guys or hit, you know, hit on some, 
not even the big one, not even the 70 yard touchdown pass, but like if they can hit on, you know, a, uh, like a 13 yard or, you yeah, know, th- like any, if, if they're getting guys in the, you know, 13 to 17 yards, you know, you know, when on first down or second down, you know, that's going to definitely make it tough, um, you know, for Auburn to, to stay in this game, you know, and then for sure the, the, the big 25, 20, 30 yard plays will be there for sure. So, um, you know, I, I can see it's picking on the linebackers early conservative mm-hmm. passing game, and then just try to run the ball early. And, uh, and then really, you know, late second quarter, early third to really see the offense start to, to challenge downfield. Yeah. Asante, uh, number nine, the linebacker, you know, we talked about him when we were looking at tape, but like, that's one that, you know, I think if Georgia can, I, you know, I feel like tomorrow we, we kind of see like last week we saw the deep, more deep route concepts. And I think that is actually very timely going into this game because I think what you want to do if you're Georgia is, you know, take a CJ Smith or an Aaron Smith or some of these guys. And I think you want to run deep routes to occupy these, these safeties that are going to be playing like cover three up top or even quarters defense at times run safeties up the middle of, or I'm sorry, run receivers into the middle of those safeties and make two of them follow your guy deep downfield. And then, you know, run levels concepts basically underneath that with Rosemi and Dylan Bell and, you know, and maybe, maybe lad truthfully um, some of those guys kind of just on those deep crossing routes, Bowers, obviously like that, I think is probably the, the way in this game, at least early. Cause if you can do that, then I think it, it kind of throws everything off for Auburn. And I, uh, I, I, I honestly am just curious to see how Georgia attacks them on the ground because, you know, with the uh, with the the run game, like, a and I'm sorry, uh, you know, a And M, they were going outside the tackles. Cal was much more inside the tackles against them to get their production. So, like, I I'm still trying to decide what that run defense is. Uh, and obviously we'll find out a lot more on Saturday, but like, I, I don't think they're world beaters against the run. Um, I don't think they're that bad either. I just think they get worn out like late in games. Yeah. I mean, with the, what I've read and I'm sure you can you know confirm that the, the talent there that Harson brought there was, is, was thin to, to not SEC quality. So we they brought in ton of, a ton of transfers and stuff, but, that just doesn't speak to them having a lot of depth and that kind of, you know, when the offense struggles and they play one to two more drives a game, that's going to definitely wear down. I just pulled up this little stat. Uh, Auburn on third, you want to get them in third down. You want to get any offense in third down, but their average yards per pass play or when they throw the ball on third down is 2.6. They have a negative EPA on passing on third down, um, 40% success rate. And whereas, whereas you look at Georgia's like, uh, EPA of 6.65, which is quite good, success rate of 52%, and a 7.0 yards per play and when they throw the ball on third down. So, um, yeah, if Georgia can stop this run, and that's why I kind of think that they're going to have to be creative. I think they're going to have to figure out a way to get four or five, six yards on first down running the ball, whether it's you know quarterback run, wildcat, or whatever it is. They can't put this offense in third and five. Third, and, I mean, third and five just seems like impossible for, for Auburn at this point. So, um, I, I, I know that, that you know, if, if Buller's going to play, Starks, Tyke Smith, they're going to want to eat on third down. So I kind of hope we get to see some of that. I'd like to see our secondary um, knock some guys around, get some balls, get our D-line some, you know, arms in the air, get some sacks. It should be a fun game for the Georgia defense. <laughs> they, should be, they should be able to handle this offense. And um, you do worry about if they do pull something out and then our edge guys aren't, um, you know, can't contain the edge. I don't, um, that gives you a little bit of concern as many Georgia fans have always worried about the uh, edge containment. Uh, it's so big in this game because, yeah. you know, uh, if you look at Auburn's rushing yards, uh, it's kind of a, a similar story, right? Like a lot of their rushing yards are going to come from outside the tackle box. Uh, what did I have? Sorry, keep talking. I'll find this stuff. Yeah, I was going to pull up some rushing stats there too. Yeah, 
on first down rushing, the Auburn is very low EPA. Okay. Um, uh, but they are six point yards a rush on first down, but an EPA of just 0.15. And Georgia's even, you know, Georgia has not been world beaters running the ball, but they do have a 0.356 um, EPA and a 57% success rate um, and an 18% explosive play rate on first down. Um, and that's on first down. I'm sorry, on first down rush, they are averaging six yards of play um, and a 7% uh, explosive play rate. Auburn's 5.4 on first down, but still that rush EPA is a third of what Georgia's is. So um, mm-hmm. you they, they've they got to figure out a way to get yards on first down. They absolutely do. Yeah. I mean, so here, uh, some nugget on Auburn rushing. Uh, we talked about Cameron Stutz, the right guard uh, in our in our film, you know, he against against uh, Texas A and M. This is all against Texas A and M. They had four carries for fifty nine yards behind right guard, and the long on that was a thirty one yarder, which you know is a long chunk. But that's not like you know, hey, we had three carries for a yard and happened to break a big one. Like that's that's consistent, successful run game. Um, and then off the left edge, so back to the setting edges, right. Four carries for 27 yards. That's 6.8 yards in attempt. Uh, two first downs on those four carries for Auburn. And then off the right edge, nine carries for 50 yards, 5.6 yards in attempt. That's a little more – I shouldn't say smoke and mirrors, but, I mean, 48 of those 50 yards came after contact. So that's running backs making plays. That's not really your, uh, your tight end, like, busting ass as an inline blocker. In, in tandem with your right tackle necessarily. So I'm, I'm curious to see, like, this is obviously, you know, a very, like, well, duh kind of statement, but um, Auburn's offense, like, what they are and the lack of explosive passing, it feels like the only way they, they really move the ball with anything resembling consistency against this Georgia defense is if Georgia's missing a lot of tackles you know, and, and just like messing up things fundamentally on defense, like setting the edge or, you know, getting over eager in terms of their, their gap responsibility with rush lanes, like guys playing defensive end, trying to come in and tackle the a gaps and, and then, you know, a cutback happens and a back finds himself in a bunch of space. So, or, or short fields, you know, we got to, we've Turners, had some, yeah. we've had some, uh, some issues on punt, punt run backs and, and kick run and kickoffs and stuff. So you just want to see us execute like we've seen the last few years on, on punt, especially because we're going to make them punt. <laughs> so uh, there will be yeah. punts galore. <laughs> it's going to yes. feel like an Iowa game. Not quite that dude. <laughs> Don't say that. But uh, I mean, like Auburn against A&M, this is a pretty damning stat. Okay. Uh, a and M six scoring opportunities, which we define as trips inside the forty. Right, uh, they got twenty points on those opportunities. Three point three three points in opportunities, really not great. That's pretty much that's a little better than what Georgia did against South Carolina when they had eight ops and twenty four points. Auburn five scoring opportunities, zero points per opportunity in that game. So like, it's just interesting. Uh, the average start, like they got pretty good average starting field position. Um, Auburn did like they, you know, I, I just, this is going to be interesting for Georgia because the, the trend that that's been correct for the last few years has been that Georgia's red, de- red zone defense is hell. And like, yes, you can drive the ball on Georgia between the twenties, but once you get into the red zone, they're going to clamp down and force a field goal last couple of weeks. You know, they South Carolina has two trips to the red zone. They score two touchdowns uh, UAB against the first team defense. I know that one of those trips came off of a muff punt, but still UAB went two for two scoring touchdowns on your first team defense in the red zone. So Georgia's has given up four straight touchdowns on red zone trips that have to change. And I think it will just knowing what we know about, you know, statistical trends and variants and Georgia's defense. It feels like tomorrow, you know, 
honestly, in a way, like maybe that the fact they've given up four straight red zone trips uh, is a good thing for Saturday because that's just not going to continue over and over against a defense that's as talented as UGA is. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you definitely want to see some of that get cleaned up. What I've kind of said on Twitter is without yeah, – I've been very careful about what I say about the offense just because it can light a Twitter fire that I don't really want to get, get into in terms sure. of – but, you know, the offense is there, you know, like it does it, everyone. What I like about it is like I've never, I mean, seen Beck panic or, or mm-hmm. look emotional, you know, you know, he certainly was disappointed in some of those big uh, passes that he couldn't connect on in the UAB game. But, you know, they're doing the things there. They have a high success rate. The EPA is fine. Not great. You know, and it's just like I feel like it's going to be there at some point, you know, just like there's not signs. Like I've seen like specifically in, in 2020, I just saw signs of just real trouble mm-hmm. with explosives and sustained success and just like kind of a kind of a sloppy, not sloppy, but but just like an offense that just wasn't just didn't have all the tools it needed. I don't see that, at least in the stats. I don't see that in this offense. I just feel mm-hmm. like I'm not saying that they're not they're hiding the playbook. They're going to be building on the playbook. I think Kirby talked about that this week. You know that yeah, they're, you always you never see the entire playbook. You're, the playbook is always a work in progress. But I do feel I would I'm hoping and expecting. Uh, you know, Graham, you've, we've done a three or four years of these now. Every time the Auburn game comes around, I'm always like kind of negative Nelly. Uh-huh. I'm not I'm not negative Nelly. I feel Ooh. like this. I know. I know. It's like I know. I feel. Yeah, bad. I think I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but that said, no, I, I do. I, I expect the off. I really do expect the offense to have a day. I, I'm kind of. I'm gonna be. I'm, what do you yeah. define as have a day against this Auburn defense that's been pretty good this year? Uh, I think we get uh, another quarterback in the game late in the game, kind of day. You know. Okay, so you think Georgia's gonna blow the? I mean, you know. I think they're gonna. I, I think the. I, I expect. I just don't see the how they're gonna score, and I think that we're not gonna. I, I don't think we're. I don't think we can score at will on Auburn, but I do think that this game is over, if not by halftime, it'll be quickly over in the third quarter. You know, and I think we're gonna have some get on the bus drives um, and some handoffs um, to to and still getting some guys in the game. I think we should. We should. We're better than this team, um, and I expect this offense to. I expect it to do what it's capable of doing. Um, yeah, I, th- I think I'm with you, man. I mean, that was one thing that was uh, very apparent to me when I was watching the UAB tape. I was like, okay, like the ceiling for this offense is actually higher than than I've thought at any point this year. Um, I think they had 12 pass plays over 10 yards. I think they had like six that were 15 plus maybe or something, something in that neighborhood. There was a lot of chunk plays – and, you know, I think if Georgia had hit one of those two deep shots that people would be talking about things a lot differently. But in reality, I think the, like, takeaway is, A, that's one play or two plays, I should say. And, B, uh, those guys were schemed open against quarters coverage, you know, against four safety looks. They're getting guys open deep. Like, that is – also kind of similar to what Georgia's going to see, if, at least if Auburn continues uh, to stay on trend for what they've been schematically on defense. Like, they're going to see, I think, a lot of, you know, similar looks to what they saw last week and had success against last week against UAB. I know the players are better, but there is some comfort in looking out as a quarterback and pre-snap seeing things that you've recognized and that you've had success before against. I – uh I, I agree with you really is my point though. Like, and I, and I think there's been all this kind of talk or thought this week from different, you know, different commentators or fans or whoever of like, Hey, uh, you know, I, I worry about um, Georgia in the spot first road game of the year and Carson Beck, new starter. I think in reality, Georgia has kind of already gone through what you'd be worried about them going through on Saturday with being down 11 points at halftime to South Carolina. I think if you didn't have that experience under your belt, I would view this game a lot differently, but like we kind of already know what the tolerance point for this team is in terms of panic. And it's, it's not low at all. So 
I don't really worry about them going in this environment. I think uh, Carson Beck's kind of attitude and emotionless sort of nature actually going into this environment might help him in some ways, like just be very uh, play with a little bit of a chip in his shoulder. I trust him to protect the football. Like there's no reason that we shouldn't at this point for him to have a, a two or three turnover game would be quite anomalous. So I, yeah, I, I think, you know, you'd like to see us play better in the red zone, um, you know, and, you know, not solve the issues there, but certainly improve on them. You know, you know, this is, you know, they're 46% success rate in the red zone. Just, you know, just they've like you talked about in the scoring opportunities they're there you know they they need to they need to improve on that for sure i agree i mean you know they were they did better last week i think their first team offense was five of five scoring touchdowns but i yeah that maybe, was like well and, and you know you put that on the on the checklist and they checked it off that's all you can do is like you, you can't play ohio state on you know it's third game week four in the season when you're playing alabama birmingham so that's correct all right, so what, what's your score prediction on this one? Uh, give me 34-6. I like it. Um, I am going to go – I'm going to say 41-10. to 10. I think Auburn gets like a garbage time touchdown against the backup defense, but I, I think Georgia's defense uh, really controls this game. So I think we're in kind of the same – same thought pattern. Yep. Um, all right. We do have other games on the slate. We are at the 50 minute mark. So, you know, we can kind of cruise through these. Um, Florida, Kentucky, interesting game. Uh, you know, anything statistically that's, that's stood out to you on this one this week? Yeah. Florida's defense is really good this year. Um, mm -hmm. it's really, really, really good. Um, they're susceptible to a uh, higher ex explosive rate, uh, than you'd like to see out of a really good defense, but even then it's still 8%. That, that EPA is, is really, really good. In fact, uh, that net, that success rate is one of three teams that are under 30% allowed, uh, for the season. Um, and that defense travels, or a defense can travel, as I should say. Um, so I, I kind of like, um, and that offense has put up points. They're averaging uh, Kentucky's offense has put up 38, but look at that success rate. It jumps out at you at 40% success rate. Um, they need big plays to score. You look at High explosive. explosive play rate, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and if Florida can contain those, you kind of like that matchup of the defense for the Florida versus Kentucky's offense. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, you turn the page and the offense – same kind of the offense is different. They the Florida offense needs a lot of plays to score. They have they they have been successful in forty nine percent of plays, which is good. Um, and you know they've got a ton of running backs there, and they got two really really good running backs in Florida. Um, I can see this game being a very low scoring game, and I can see Florida getting a getting a win uh, on the road in Lexington. Yeah, the only thing that scares me for for like. I agree with all of your logic. The only thing that uh, I'm struggling with in terms of picking Florida in this game is their, their red zone play has just been so horrendous. Um, I mean, they were terrible against Charlotte last week. Like just, you know, I saw uh, one of the Florida kind of beat guys. Um, I forget who it was. So I feel bad for not giving them proper credit, but I saw they posted on Twitter, this thing where they had kind of gone back over Napier's history and, Historically speaking, when he runs an offense, if they're bad in the red zone early in the year, then they stay bad in the red zone. Um, yeah, I mean, Florida, seven opportunities against Charlotte, 3.14 points per an opportunity. That's not good. I mean, on the flip side, they only gave up 1.4 points per an opportunity on defense. Defense is really good, but like beating Charlotte 22 to 7. Uh, I want money on that, but it still scares me a little bit. Like, I don't know, though. I, I think that Kentucky, like you said, like, it's been so choppy. And I feel like this game probably comes down to, like, a special teams play or something like that, you know. Um, I am not betting this game personally. 
I am probably going to play that under of 44 and a half. But, uh, yeah, this, this reeks like 17, 13. Yeah, totally. Seven, 17, 10, something like that. Yeah. Or, you know, some weird Kentucky, Florida score where it's like 20 to, you know, 16 or I don't know. Um, I'll go with, I'm going to go with Kentucky just because of their ability to muck up games and their run defense, I think is, you know, it's been, I trust Kentucky as a program in this spot from a run defense standpoint, they've given me enough proof of that over the years. So I'll go with Kentucky just to be contrarian, but I don't have a strong lean either way. Um, Oregon state, Utah Friday night. Have any feel there? Um, you know, Oregon state kind of had a disappointing loss, uh, the other night. And, um, I was kind of hoping to was pulling for the Beavers. Uh, you're pulling up that game, right? Let me pull it up on my end too, just so I can refresh my, to. what's the line in that? Do you have the line? I do have the line. It is Oregon state is favored by three and a half. They are. Yeah. At home. I remember this, the, you know, this is one of these games where, you know, metrically uh, Washington only beat them, you know, on the scoreboard, you know, Oregon state had a 53% success rate, beat them there, beat them in explosive play rate. Um, and just, just scoring opportunities. They beat them there. Just, it's kind of a third down. It looks like third down was where they might've lost a game. Um, I guess Washington state. Yeah. Yeah. I guess Washington state. So, you know, San, uh, this is, this is San Diego state at Oregon state, right? Um, no, this is Utah at Oregon Utah. state. Utah. Sorry. That was, I got too many stats. Sorry, boss. Well, I'll go ahead and give my pick. Uh, you know, Utah played that 14-7 to seven disgusting game with UCLA at home last week. Utah doesn't lose at home, but they aren't at home. And Oregon State, as you pointed out, Washington State, uh, Cam Ward was able to do some, some things through the air in a major way to get up early. And that kind of game scripted Oregon State's run game out of this a little bit last week. But uh, Utah is not playing at home, and Utah – has not shown that they can pass the ball effectively and efficiently whatsoever, aside from, you know, one explosive pass play on the first play of the season against Florida. So I'm going to pick Oregon state uh, minus the three and a half to, to win at home. Yeah, this is an, I, I, I kind of highlighted this in one of the posts I put this week that, yeah, this, I don't think the PAC 12 runs through um, Utah this season. Yeah. I mean, they've got an offense of 38% success rate on offense, 4.9 yards per play. That's not going to, that's not going to get it done on the road. You, you got the Oregon state's not going to be held to, you know, less than 20 points at home. Um, and I, Utah is going to have a tough time getting that many points. So I like your play. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you on that. I am with you. Um, I I think, yeah, I think we're all, I think we're seeing that one the same way. So, uh, before you know any, you don't have any uh, Friday. I'm sorry, Thursday night action. Do you on Middle Tennessee, Western Kentucky, or Temple Tulsa? Uh, I don't. I don't. I'm concentrating on Power Five, but I wish I did. That's probably that's probably smart. Um. I have been fading the shit out of NC State for a while. They've got Louisville at home tomorrow night, and NC State's been pretty terrible, but Louisville's only a three-and-a-half point favorite despite being pretty good statistically and 4-0. and oh. So uh, my general betting premise so far this season has been like Vegas knows what they're doing, and uh, there's kind of some Easter eggs out there sometimes if you just like – pay attention to lines and i think this is one of those so i'm going to take nc state plus three and a half in that game uh on my picks i'm also on uh byu they're a one point dog uh i'm just gonna you know probably money line them at minus 105 they got cincinnati at home that's a 8 15 mountain time start 10 15 eastern start i saw a stat this week that byu is like some uh, under Sataki at, at night, they are like 49 and six straight up or something. Um, 
despite, you know, often being underdogs in some of those games. So I'm on that. Uh, I like BYU on Friday night against Cincy up in Provo. Uh, I like Alabama big at um, Mississippi State. Do you? Okay. Yeah. Uh, that Mississippi State offense is not very good. Um, I think the Georgia and the Alabama defense is quite good. Um, mm-hmm. I I have this little Discord that uh, what's it called? Deep Dive DJ's Discord. They were talking about that game, and I they had this one little play. That. That sounds like yeah, it, <laughs> it's it, yeah, it's, and the deep dive podcast is great. They, they primarily they talk a lot of NFL, but um, they uh, uh, Dan Weiner is a uh, the, he's a podcast host, and he's super active on the Discord. I like him. He's from the South too. He's a he's a Texas fan, Falcons fan. But anyway, shout out to him. He's been awfully good. But you know, he said he liked. Uh, under 15 and a half big time um, for total points scored by Mississippi State. He can see it like a shutout, you know, which, you know, look at him, it kind of makes sense. Or no touchdowns, you know, no touchdown prop might be something you want to play with. I think Alabama comes out um, and takes care of business down there in Stark, Vegas. The only thing that scares me about that, look, this is one of those games, and you're going to laugh, but like this is a game where I will, I could honestly see myself betting. Alabama minus 14 and a half and like basically hedging that bet with a Mississippi state money line bet just because the cumulative stats say everything that you're saying, but this line should be, you know, just based on what we know, this line should be way bigger and it's not. And I think, you know, Mississippi state finally abandoned what they were trying to do on offense uh, and just went back to their old air raid shit last week against South Carolina, and it worked for them. Like they they kind of tore that secondary up, and and that's not a bad secondary. We saw that secondary against Georgia. Like they're good. Um, they're not great, but they are good. I, you're probably right, but uh, I w- I would be lying if I if I didn't tell you that I had Mississippi State plus fourteen and a half written on my. Uh, on my sheet with a money line sprinkle just because it just just back to that kind of Vegas Easter egg thing. Like that, that line should be like 23 and a half. You know what I mean? Like 14 and a half is not enough points. Um, but I could be totally wrong. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I that is a weird line. Uh, you know, it's not start, you know, it's a night on the road, but that's not, more than three points so no. exactly i mean so yeah I, I think we'll see you're probably right like i said well i mean alabama uh, hasn't put up a lot of points either all season long you know that's it's not true. like so i think that's i think that's where that number comes from they can see you know uh you know a 30 to 30 to whatever you know 10 30 to Mississippi State's defense has been pretty good against the run as well um you know, so it's like if they can force Milro to pass to win that game, then the level of variance there is really high just because he might he might hit five deep shots or he might turn the ball over three times. I, I don't know, you know. Yeah, I like it. Uh, we'll see. I've been I've been wrong before. <laughs> well, we all have. Um, what do you think about Texas A&M, Arkansas at, at Jerry World? Uh, A&M seems to be putting together a pretty good season. Um, you know, I don't, I can see this no, uh, no Wegman, no Wegman for the rest of the year. Um, but you know, Max Johnson's, I think he's better. I don't know if he's better, but he's certainly capable. You know, they're, you know, he's like, sometimes people freak out, you know, about what, uh, you know, injury cluster injuries are a problem, but when you've got a guy that's played at this level, you know, that probably was right there um, in the camp and, and probably ran plenty of ones. And certainly he played well on, on uh, I guess a decent defense, you know, that's a good defense that he played came up early in that game and, and won mm-hmm. that game. So uh, I, I like, I like a and What's, what's the line? Minus six for Texas. A&M. Yeah. 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 Under a touchdown. I, I, I would, I would probably play. Yeah, the uh, Aggies on that. Yeah, Arkansas, uh, they covered for me last week against LSU. I think that might have been kind of their, you know, not to say they won't play hard for Pittman because they will, but it's like that game sort of felt like their last stand in a lot of ways uh, after losing to BYU the week before. 
I just, I mean, they're just defense is just not very good. And, um, you know, I, I don't think AM's past defense is anything special, but I think it's better than LSU's. And so I, uh, I'm going to follow you, AM minus six there. I'm trying to see what else we got on the board. Uh, Michigan, Nebraska, do anything for you? Michigan favored by 17. Yeah. Over under 39. What a terrible Big Ten football game. You know what? Fuck that. We're not talking about Michigan, Nebraska. Uh, this is our show, dude. We're not giving them any air. Uh, USC, Colorado. 10 a.m. local start out here in the Rockies. Uh, Trojans favored by 21 and a half. Over under is a cool 73.5. What do you like? Um, I like it, everything I like about anything offense is USC starts with USC. I mean, they're the, without a doubt, the best offense, not without it. I mean, I'd say, you know, Washington is Washington, really, really, yeah. really, really good too. I mean, they're, I mean, they're one and two just about in everything. Um, I, you know, this will be a fun game to watch. This is a good popcorn game. You know what I mean? Because I don't have a dog in the fight. I have plenty of reasons to, it's a good nooner. To, yeah. D- d- dislike both these teams. Um, I kind of want to see, you what USC does defensively if they make a statement on the road, it, you know they they've been thumping their chest about improved defense. I've seen a lot of missed tackles. It's it, you know what they're what they expect as a good defense is is what you expected out of Oklahoma's defense. Was it great? It was a it was only okay, but the offense was is always covering up what that defense can do. But Shador Sanders holds the ball a lot. He's taking a lot of sacks. Um, you know, he's, you know, he's like, I don't know, like 20 sacks already this year. Yeah. So, um, you know, if they give him time to throw, you know, maybe they can score some points, but if you're a championship quality team, like USC should be an, and is what they have their site set on, you go out there and you beat Colorado handily, you know? Um, so I, I would, I wouldn't have any trouble laying 21 in that game. Um, 21 and, and a half. Yeah. 20, 21 and a half. Yeah. I, I, I haven't seen, I, I think at some point the, the, the energy is going to return to normal there and, and Boulder. And I can see sort of, you know, this, this team not getting much over five wins and they might have, they might have trouble getting to five. Look at this. Uh, just, you know, this is your slide for USC's offense versus Colorado's defense. <laughs> this is so sick. All of this dark blue, man. Um, yeah. All right, so I'm on the other side of this, and it's just because Lincoln Riley's next good defense is going to be this first good defense, and until I see it, I ain't believing it. Arizona State against Fresno State, they got shut out, I believe, 29 to nothing at home, had seven turnovers with Drew Pine under center. Last week, uh, they go and they they gave USC a game for four quarters legitimately like they were down a possession all night i watched that game uh you know it was the last game on of the night like i thought it was honestly like i had started watching like netflix or some shit and i just kind of had it chilling on the ipad and then it started to get get good and so i put it back on the main screen but um look man i mean giving up 353 yards to this arizona state offense is just it's football malpractice. And I think Alex Grinch is garbage. They gave up 21 first downs to that Arizona state team. Uh, I just like Arizona state only punted three times in that game. Uh, Man, I just, I can't trust USC to cover 21 and a half against anybody right now that has a pulse on offense because I just like, you know, that their run defense was very suspect in that game. And and Drew Pine, who was terrible, threw for 221 yards on him. I just – I can't do it, man. And, it's, and, I, and we're not talking about garbage time shit here. Like, we're talking about, like, actual, you know, ball game is close. Uh, USC outgained them by a crazy amount yards per play-wise. I think they had, like, a three-and-a-half yards per play advantage, but they couldn't finish in the red zone. And that scares me a little bit going into this game because I think, you know, Colorado, I don't think they're good at anything on defense, but I think they're okay in the red zone. I, I, I think USC wins by like 14 or something, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the the buffs to cover the 21 and a half. I'll be curious what the energy is like there if, the, if that stadium is filled up at noon. It will be. 
You think you don't yeah. think the you you don't think you think they've got the attention span for this after getting thumped? They do. I mean, my uh, so my my mother in law, her uh, boyfriend partner is also her. Uh, ironically, it's actually her first husband. Fun story there. Um, but uh, they, you know, he his daughter uh, went to see you, and so he's had season tickets for the buffs uh like he lives in philly but he's had season tickets for the buffs for i don't know 30 years now maybe 20 years um he told me the other day that he sold his usc tickets and made twice what he paid for his entire season ticket package off of selling his tickets for that one game so did like he, I, I did, I did he sell it to somebody with a 310 <laughs> A three one zero. What does that mean? Or, oh, uh, eight one eight. Yeah, someone SoCal. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. That's a, that's a good question. I sure. I think I think USC might show up. Uh, I don't know. I don't. Know. I'm. It's a good nooner, like you said. It, by the way, can, I know we got to wrap this up. Did you take plus three and a half Louisville? Uh, I mean, like uh, NC State over Louisville, or was that last week? That was last week. I took NC. Yeah, I did. I did. I like NC okay. State. Why? Oh, I'm I'm big on Louisville this year. That's interesting. I was. I, I know was, I have I was, been too, but I just at some point there's the bounce back, right? Like I don't think Louisville's r- really like running the table, and yeah, there's a. F- I think I can't might- get over what that Indiana defense and maybe offense for that matter actually uh, did to them. Like they've looked good on offense. That'll be a, that'll be a good game. That'll be a good game. It's a good I mean, Friday you- game. Yeah, and you talk about, and like you said, you that's I mean you talked about it. I'm sorry we keep going back to a game we talked about ten minutes ago, but that's such a good point about the little Vegas stuff, you know. And for anybody that's dabbling in the matrix, don't ever underestimate incorporating the Vegas line into in your in your thinking in your stats, whatever they know what they're doing, and they they're way better at the stats than I am. Sorry, I'm just I, I was oh, you're good. I died totally. We're at buck ten buck ten in the show. We can do whatever. If you're still want. here, you're probably related to us what's um, up harry what's up harry <laughs> harry l our guy uh kansas going to texas texas 16 and a half point favorite that has quietly kind of been shit in every game they've played except for the one against alabama rock uh, chalk baby let's go plus 16 and a half Plus sixteen and a half. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I still haven't with seen. You. I haven't seen what the offense really get going. Now, look, I mean, Kansas' defense is terrible too, but um, I think I think it's a good coach. That Leipold, Leipold, yeah, Lance Leipold, uh, yeah, and you know, I, I, I can, I can see them putting up some points and covering that. I'm not I think they will. I'm not I taking mean, a money line on it or anything, but no, I, 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 but like, I like Kansas to, to cover. I, I think they'll score. You know, the play in that game is honestly probably the uh, – it, it's probably the uh, the over of 61 because I think both teams can, can score. But um, I still like Kansas plus 16 and a half. Uh, LSU Ole Miss, I think I already know what you're doing here. Um I can't. This line though is another one of those Easter egg type lines. LSU is only favored by two and a half points, and I know that LSU played a close one against Arkansas last week. Over under in this game is sixty seven points, dude. So they clearly don't think that you know LSU can do to Ole Miss's offense what Bama did to it. LSU is a team that's hard to to have faith They're in. Hard to handicap. Yeah, um, I mean, and and I, I can't think I can't d- do this game with a clear head. I mean, I've got I've got an agenda against uh, against Lane Kiffin. <laughs> so, um, but you know what, <laughs> the offense is just not as good as it was last year. This is you know you know Quinshawn Judkins was came in as the number one returning running back in the SEC. You know they were 50, yeah, I think 50, he's been so banged up a little. He's been banged up, you know. But this was a, you know Jackson Dart was running the ball, and they're they're. Their rushing game is is very not good. <laughs> Four point yards a carry, thirty nine percent success rate. I mean, their passing game has picked it up a little bit, but um, you know, 
LSU's defense at some point has got enough talent. They've got to – I mean, they're good in the front seven. You, I don't know if you've got the screen up. I'm looking at mine. You know, you got Wingo and Perkins and some of these guys in the front that, you know, are okay. I mean, per- Wingo's having a good year. But, you know, but the secondary is just – It's you know, garbage. You- I mean, dude, and I, you know, not to, not to pick on anybody, but, like, uh, Major Burns, you know, on that defense, like, was a guy that couldn't they're, – they're playing some guys that aren't, I think, what you're used to seeing in their back end. Uh, like, there you go, Major Burns right there, safety. He leads the team in different – you know, leads the back seven in snaps, but 58.5 coverage grade, man. Like, And when your safety is making 21 tackles at this point in the year, like, that's not a good sign. Um Denver Harris, I guess they finally decided to throw his ass out there, but uh, I don't you know. None of those guys are playing it. Like, they're, this is just like nothing it, good to yeah, be said I, I, about their secondary. This will be a good test of the, of a narrative about the bounce back. You know, I, I have, I just don't think Lane Kiffin's that great of a ball coach. I think he's a good offensive mind. I think uh-huh. he's, 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 you know, he, he probably is a good, but, I mean, like, but, like, I just, this is a game that it, they might win it and I can, you know, I'll eat crow all day long on it. But I just feel like he, 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 I could see him not ready to play this game after last week. I mean, and it'll be good popcorn well, game. You know, I mean, that's all narrative and stuff. But I mean, like, he's, just, I just don't, I just don't believe that he can, he can scheme it, you know, and I think. I, I kind of trust uh, the talent there with LSU. Um, and like I said, there's problems with the offense for Ole Miss. And I think LSU can score on anybody. I don't dislike that. Um, all right. Two games. Uh, two games left. Notre Dame going to Duke. College game day coming to Durham. Uh, you know, big game. The. Irish are favored by five and a half after absolutely shitting down their leg at the end of the Ohio State game last week and playing 10 dudes on the field and then letting Ryan Day cut a uh, Roid Rage wrestling promo against 89 year old Lou Holtz. It was a scene, bro. It was a whole thing. Um, I like Duke. I have won a lot of money betting on Duke this year. I mean, I bet the Clemson game four ways, and all of those ways had to do with Clemson not scoring very many points and Duke covering, and they did. Uh, Like, I'm a fan of Riley Leonard. I just don't think that they got the dudes up front for a game like this. I think Notre Dame bounces back and covers the five and a half. Yeah, it's – Notre Dame's got one of those really good defensive um, footprints, you know, statistically speaking. Um, Duke is good on offense, uh, really good at passing the ball. Not a lot of explosive, explosive plays passing the ball, which I think kind of plays into what they can offer up defensively on Notre Dame. You know, if you want to zoom in on that defense, look at those guys, the D-line and linebackers. You know, there's a lot of good players right there in that front seven that and maybe their secondary is not quite as good, but I just don't know if that Duke can challenge that secondary. So I kind of like Notre Dame in a bounce back here by maybe. uh, Yeah, like I can see this getting 10 to 14 and, you know, getting out early for uh, for Notre Dame. Yeah, I I think that's what's going to happen as well. Uh, South Carolina going on the road to Knoxville. We got a we got a Hendon Hooker uh, revenge game. We've got a uh, Tennessee playoff hopes revenge game. Um, you know, South Carolina derailed their entire season last year uh, in Columbia after it looked like the Vols were destined to make the playoff. Now they get a chance to bounce back. Tennessee is favored by 12 and a half in this game. Uh, the over under is 62 and a half, which is a lot of points when you consider the fact that Tennessee uh, really struggled to score against Florida in the swamp. And, you know, they they looked better against UTSA. Great. 
I mean, they scored 30 on Austin P. I I don't know how much you can really tell off of a game like that, but yeah, that game was, I think, delayed too. So, I mean, it was just, kind yeah, of, it was a weird game. Um, yeah. I'm not holding that one against them, but dude, what do you think? Like, 12 well, and a half seems like a lot. 12 and a half is a lot. Um, but it's, a, here's the thing. Here's what I want to say about Tennessee. This, uh, Hendon Hooker, that t- it shows you how good Hendon Hooker was for that offense. And I think with the right guy and, you know, that that offense can be – and you've talked about it a bunch, you know, but it's, you've, I believe gimmick is a term you've been u- that you can use to describe it. Uh, but but Joe Milton is not that guy. He's, he's a good quarterback. He's not great. He doesn't have the touch. He doesn't have the deci- decision-making. And their offensive pass numbers are – down significantly this is yeah. not a this is not a team that can go run 90 plays uh, you know have 50 percent success rate and just and rack up 500 yards now if they can do it they'll need and if there is a hope for this for tennessee to be a contender for the sec and and in the playoff they've got to do it against this defense which can give up plays, um, you know, and, and the d- passing game success rate for the d- Tennessee for, excuse me, the passing game success rate for South Carolina is 48%. So, but I, you know, I just, I just don't believe it. I, I, I mean, I'm, I think Tennessee is going to get the win, but I just think it's just going to be another one of those ugly wins. Uh, I don't think, I, I kind of like the under there. Uh, yeah. Uh, that seems like a lot of points to, to put up. Um, I think, I think I can, this game could be a rock fight. Um, you know, and I, I think Beamer can can scheme up and figure out a way to, to keep his team in it and uh, put some pressure on him. I'd be curious to see what how they how they do under pressure at home. Like if, if they have another struggle on offense, right? Yeah, I could. Oh, yeah, they get ugly. Yeah, Tennessee. <laughs> uh, they're a really good rush defense, and that's great. But even if they weren't a really good rush defense, they would still probably shut down South Carolina's run game because their run game is bad. Like, we know that South Carolina is not going to move the football on the ground. They're going to have to do it through the air. You said that Joe Milton's not that guy, and I agree with you. But you know who is that guy? Spencer Rattler is that dude, all right? Like, he has done everything that you can ask anybody to do. He hangs in the pocket and gets wrecked, knowing that he's going to get wrecked, and delivers balls. Like, he plays all out to give his team a chance to win. And I think he lo- he is a guy that is built for these kind of moments. They play better as a team, as a program, you know, on the road, kind of under the lights at times, like against better teams. They savor these spots. Beamer, in a lot of ways, is flawed as a coach on a week-to-week basis, but he's really good at getting his team up for these types of games. Um, I think South Carolina covers – and I, you know, I, I don't think that Tennessee is going to be able to really run the ball super well on South Carolina's defense, um, which means this game starts falling onto the shoulders of Joe Milton. And if we're talking about like two teams that are one dimensional and both relying on the pass, one is relying on Spencer Rattler. The other is relying on Joe Milton. I'm going to bet on the one that's got Spencer Rattler right now. I'll take South Carolina plus 12 and a half, and I will also probably uh, sprinkle some money line action on that. I think that this is probably your you know, your, your best chance for a big upset this week in the SEC. I like it. I like it a lot. All right, brother. That is that. Uh, that's our show for this week. Thank you so much for getting all these clips together uh, for us. And uh, – for for the awesome pdf um go uh go follow josh on twitter at dog stats but uh also like check out his website dogstats.com if you paid for his preseason preview guide that was also beautiful and in-depth like you've been sending out emails with this stuff in it to people like the talk about a value man <laughs> uh, for 7.99 i think it was uh for the preview guide like yeah this is, is a labor Labor of love. It's a labor of love at this point. So, well, yeah, no, and and you know, you get it. It's everything is also dogcentral.com. But if you're not a dog fan, you're you're a dog fan. You're on Dog Central. It's always Come to good. Dog Central. And... We're, we're I'm always there for you. I'm always there. <laughs> you can ask Josh questions and stuff. Maybe you know. You can correct. Fun. You can, you could point out the typos and the wrong columns, which is yeah. always exactly. It's a it's a it's a group effort. 
it's a labor of love on your end, but uh, for us, it's a love of your labor, buddy. So um, thank you for what you do. And uh, we will see you guys. Uh, I'll be back with some film review for Auburn. Uh, I am going to be on the road next week on the way to Athens. I will be in town for the Kentucky game. Uh, so pod schedules and stuff might be a little choppy and weird, but we'll figure it out and we'll, we'll get something out at some point for you guys. If you're, Hey, if you're not to spring this on you online, but on, on air, but if you're struggling to, to put some tape down, I got an idea of maybe some watch along. Like if I cut this game up, we do a, like a watch along with the community. I love be it. Kind of fun where yeah, everybody can just, yeah. Like everybody can kind of like jump in and talk about it. So we can figure something out fun. Sounds great to me, man. I'm all for it. Um, all right, buddy. Uh, we will see you guys.